Come in. I'm washing my hands. Hi, Mr. Hoffman. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. My name is Nancy. I'm a nurse. I'm going to be doing an assessment of your belly. Okay. All right. I'm going to start out by asking you two questions. Um, are, are you over 50? Yes, I am. And have you had a colonoscopy screening for cancer? Yes, I have. Oh, good. That's an important um, preventative care uh, measure to take. And do you have any history of problems with your gut or your, ab your abdomen or your stomach, ulcers? No, I don't. All right. Okay, so I'm going to start by looking at your belly. So I'm going to look from here, and I'm looking at the contour, which is the fancy word for shape. And your abdomen is a little rounded. And then I'm going to come down here from the foot of the bed and look for symmetry. Both sides should be the same, which they are. And then I'm going to come back here and I'm going to look at your umbilicus, or commonly known as the belly button. And I'm looking for any lesions or any problems or any skin discolorations or um, many young people have a piercing here, so you would want to know that. And then I'm going to look at the abdomen overall for skin color and any lesions. This is a common place for moles. And so um, we do look at moles as part of skin assessment, but also part of the abdomen, that you would be looking at the skin for anything abnormal. And then also I'm looking for movement. I should see normal respiratory movement of the abdomen, which I do see. And also right here in the epigastric area, many times you can see the pulsations of the aorta. That is a normal finding and is seen commonly. Some people you can see it, some people not. Usually in thin people, um, it's visible. And I do see the aortic pulsations here, and I see the respiratory movement that's normal. I do not see any waves of peristalsis. It's uncommon to see, but you would do want to look for that. Auscultation of the abdomen, the use of the stethoscope to listen, is to generally assess bowel sounds and bruits, or murmurs. Use the diaphragm of your stethoscope. Warm up the diaphragm of your stethoscope by placing it in your hands. This makes it more comfortable when laid on the skin of the patient. Listen for bowel sounds in the abdomen to the right of the umbilicus, where the mid portion of the small bowel is located. Proceed to listen to all four quadrants. Normally, bowel sounds are low-pitched, gurgling sounds that occur every 5 to 10 seconds with peristalsis, or bowel movement. Note that this frequency varies per person. Therefore, listen for at least two minutes before concluding that the bowel sounds are absent. Absence of bowel sounds for greater than two minutes of listening may indicate that there is no peristalsis, which usually implies an ileus. Very high-pitched bowel sounds can be associated with a mechanical obstruction, such as a small bowel obstruction, which increases the volume and frequency of bowel sounds. Here is a demonstration of auscultation of all four quadrants. Listen for at least 5 to 10 seconds in each quadrant. Auscultation for bruies is an important part of the exam. A bruy is an abnormal swishing or blowing sound from blood flowing through a narrow or partially occluded artery. It can be thought of as a vascular murmur. Please note, a bruy is auscultated or heard versus a thrill, which has a similar pathology, but is palpated. There are five areas in the abdominal exam to auscultate a bruy. The aorta, bilateral renal arteries, bilateral iliac arteries, hepatic artery, and the splenic artery. Place the stethoscope about two-thirds down from the xiphoid, or epigastrium, between it and the umbilicus for the aorta. Place the stethoscope about three centimeters superior and lateral to the umbilicus on both the left and right side for the bilateral renal arteries. On some people, this might be approximated by drawing an imaginary line down the point just proximal to the midclavicular line. 
place the stethoscope about 3 cm inferior and lateral to the umbilicus on both the left and right side for the iliac arteries. Place the stethoscope along the right costal margin, laterally at approximately the midclavicular line for the hepatic artery. Place the stethoscope along the left costal margin, approximately 2 cm inferior and lateral, moving posteriorly to the midclavicular line. This accounts for the posterior location of the spleen for the splenic artery. Auscultate for bruits over the aorta, bilateral renal arteries, and bilateral iliac arteries. Next, I'm going to percuss the uh, abdominal quadrants. And percuss for the size of the liver. And it should be between about 6 and 12 centimeters, okay? Another possibility to determine the size of the liver is the scratch test, although its reliability and precision remain controversial. One method is to place the stethoscope on the chest just below the xiphoid process. Lightly scratch the abdominal skin in the right lower quadrant with a fingernail, parallel to the expected liver border. The air-filled bowel loops under the fingertip poorly transmit the sound waves to the stethoscope. Proceed with the scratch test by gradually moving cranially towards the rib cage. The transition from bowel to liver tissue, through which sound waves can travel faster, is notable for a sudden increase in the loudness of the scratching and marks the lower liver border. Continue the scratch test further upwards until a sudden drop in loudness is observed, marking the transition from liver to lung. This is where the upper liver border is located. Percussion of the spleen is not an exact science by any means, but sometimes you can get a hint that the spleen is enlarged. Uh, Castelli's method consists of following the anterior auxiliary line to the very last intercostal space that you can feel and percussing there. And normally that should be tympanitic because the stomach bubble is sitting there. And if when the patient takes a deep breath, that tympanitic note changes to dull, that suggests the spleen might be enlarged. And in this case, it does change. That is called Castelli's sign. It should just prompt you to look more carefully for splenic enlargement. So listen to the change in note here. The patient's in end expiration now. I ask him to take a deep breath. Breathe out. Castelli's sign is said to be suggestive of splenic enlargement. However, when I palpated, I was unable to feel the spleen. When the abdomen is distended, checking for a fluid wave will help you distinguish between dilated loops of bowel, fat, and free fluid. Only fluid will transmit a pressure wave. Test for this by having an assistant or the patient fix the midline of the abdomen with the edge of his hand. Hold one of your hands against the patient's flank and tap the patient's opposite flank with the fingertips of the other hand. If free fluid exists, you will feel a fluid wave strike your hand. Okay, at this point, Tom, I'm going to have you take your hand and place it at midline, like this. And I will um, grab your right flank and I'm going to tap with my left hand on your left flank, checking for a fluid wave with my right hand. Testing for shifting dullness is a way to check for excessive fluid or ascites within the abdominal cavity. Free fluid within the abdomen moves to dependent locations as the patient changes position. Air-filled loops of bowel rise to the superior parts of the abdomen. With the patient in the supine position, percuss from midline and move laterally toward the flank. Note the location at which the percussion note changes from tympanitic to dull. Mark this point with a pen. Then have the patient roll onto his side and repeat the percussion procedure. When free fluid is present, the level at which dullness appears shifts. Now Tom, at this point I'm going to percuss on your abdomen. I'm going to start at midline and percuss laterally, noting the change from tympanitic to dull. 
and I'm going to mark that line. Okay. Now I'm going to have you turn on your side towards me. And again, I'm going to percuss from midline laterally, checking for any changes in the dullness. And there are no changes noted, which means that there is no free fluid within the abdominal cavity. Now we'll go ahead and um, palpate the abdomen, first lightly. Just tell me if you feel any discomfort. Okay. And then a little more deeply. Okay. Now I'm going to try to feel the edge of your liver. To palpate the liver, place your left hand behind the chest margin and your right hand lateral to the rectus abdominis muscles and well below the lower border of liver dullness. Again. Press gently into the abdomen and as the patient breathes deeply, try to feel for the liver edge as it moves down. If possible, let the liver slip under your finger pads as you feel its surface. Let's try there again. Once more. Let it out. Take a real deep breath. You often need to try again using different pressures and moving your fingertips closer to the costal margin. Once again, please. The hooking technique may also be helpful. Standing to the right of the patient's chest, place the fingers of both hands below the border of liver dullness and press in and up toward the costal margin. Ask the patient to take a deep breath. Deeper one more time. All right, out. This liver is not palpable. All right, that's fine. And palpate the spleen. Go ahead and breathe in. And out. Good. And palpate for the kidneys. And for the kidneys. Okay. And then I'm going to palpate the size of the aorta. And that is very normal. Okay. Rebound tenderness is an important sign indicating peritoneal irritation. The palpating hand is slowly and gently pressed deeply into the abdomen, then quickly released. If peritoneal irritation exists, the maneuver is quite painful. Ask the patient where the pain is most intense. Okay, Tom, at this point in time, I'm going to um, check rebound tenderness in the abdomen. I'm going to palpate gently but deeply with quick release and checking for any pain with that. Ask the patient to exhale while palpating the gallbladder area medial to the midclavicular line. Now instruct the patient to take a deep breath so the gallbladder is pushed down and against the examiner's fingertips as the lungs expand. If cholecystitis is present, the patient will experience a sharp and sudden pain causing them to abruptly cease inhalation. This reaction is known as a positive Murphy's sign. A positive psoas sign is another indicator of acute appendicitis. The appendix lies close to the iliopsoas muscle, so if the appendix is inflamed, any maneuver that tenses or stretches the iliopsoas muscle may result in increased right lower quadrant pain. One way is to have the patient try to flex the right hip by raising the right leg against the resistance of your hand. Tom, I'm going to have you raise your right leg against my resistance and let me know if you have any pain. The obturator sign is another sign of appendiceal irritation. The internal obturator muscle lies close to the appendix on the right. When this muscle is stretched in the setting of an acute appendicitis, the patient experiences increased right lower quadrant pain. To perform this test, flex the patient's leg at the hip and the knee, then internally rotate the hip. This stretches the internal obturator muscle. Okay, Tom, I'm going to flex the knee and the hip and internally rotate